Good morning. We are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Spring 2018 Symposium of the Journal of Law and Public Policy. My name is Mohamed Abumayale, and I have the honor of being the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal. Today's event um, is also honored by the two co-sponsors, the law firm of Barnes and Thornburg and the law firm of Fagri Baker Daniels. The title of this symposium is Blockchain and the Crypto Economy, New Roles and Systems. Uh, here's our agenda for today. We've invited scholars and practitioners from around the country to come and speak on topics that are of high interest and relevant to you. In this symposium, we hope to take an in-depth look at this disruptive innovation and see the positive impact it will have and how it will propel us into a crypto economy. We also seek to examine the role of the legal profession and other industries in growing and regulating the crypto economy. I know for myself, and many of you may be the same, this is a relatively, or it's, it's a new topic. Um, and it's a complex one that's difficult to understand, especially uh, when you're thinking of things from a centralized perspective. We're very fortunate here at the University of St. Thomas to have a leading expert in this area as a professor, who is also the journal's advisor in coordinating this event, which brings me to our first speaker, who will also serve as a moderator for today's panels, Professor Wolf Call. Wolf Call is a leading expert at the intersections of law, business, and technology. His research focuses on innovation, technology, blockchain technology, applications, smart contracts, initial coin offerings, hedge funds, and dynamic regulatory methods. Professor Call is also a leading expert on private investment fund regulation and compliance and private investment fund innovation in finance. His scholarship constitutes over 85% of the empirical and theoretical scholarships on private fund regulation in the United States. Please join me in welcoming Professor Call. Test, hello. Can everybody hear me? Hello and welcome, thanks for coming. Um, so before I go into what I want to talk about just as a sort of a warm up session, I wanna talk a little bit more about um, what's coming for this, uh, for this conference. Um, so I'll talk about blockchain innovation and the law. Many of you have heard me, at least most of the students here have heard me talk about this. Um, so I apologize if this is some, somewhat repetitive for some. But um, I'm really just a warm up session for my colleague Carla Reyes who will be talking about what regulators are actually doing right, right now in terms of implementing the, uh, the uses of uh, blockchain technology. And so that's a very exciting uh, topic. So Carla, uh, we'll talk about that. Then we'll take a quick break. Um, we have uh, Will Turner with us. Uh, Will Turner is one of the uh, leading uh, crypto lawyers uh, in Chicago and, and the nation, as a matter of fact. So Will will talk with, uh, with us a little bit about the implications, give us his perspective from his practice. He isn't quite here yet, so <laughs> we're having our fingers crossed that he can make it in the next hour or so. Um, then we'll take uh, lunch. Over lunch, we have Linda Wolf um, speaking about blockchain for good. So she's talking mostly about her role with the UN um, in, uh, and her role in bringing crypto startups that have sustainable development goals to market. Yeah? So she's been working with the UN uh, for, for many, many years, and now we're at a point where we see critical mass of crypto startups who want to do good for the world. Um, so healing the planet, creating sustainable solutions, um, avoiding poverty, uh, anything that's U UN sustainability goals, there, 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 there's a crypto startup for that. Yeah, so she's, um, if you want, she's uh, bringing them all together and making sure that they can, can go to market. Yeah, so it's, uh, she's so very influential uh, in, that, in that sphere. And so she'll talk to us about her work um, over lunch. Then our next uh, panel is uh, Nicolette Kayen and Charles Huang. Uh, Nicolette will talk mostly about asset tokenization. And um, Charles will, will give us a perspective on, on his startup as well. Um, so that's uh, mostly asset tokenization. Then uh, my co-founder Craig Calcaterra will talk to us about blockchain problems and possible solutions. And in other, wo in other words, for those of you who know which are 
in, in, at what stage we are in crypto. Yeah, so crypto has been around for about 10 years. We're now um, at the third wave, the third generation, if you want, of crypto startups. Yeah, so today I would label um, Ethereum's uh, attempts with Casper, NEO, uh, Cardano, um, EOS, all of those are third generation blockchains that try to get to scalability. So Visa type level of uh, transactions, 300,000 plus. Nobody's there yet, but they're trying. Yeah? Um, all of these have a problem. The problem is that they are not what we consider fourth generation blockchains, which um, entail the ability to upgrade protocols evolutionarily, if you want, yeah? in an evolutionary natural development of um, blockchain protocols. That's very few, uh, no, nobody that I know really talks about this. So uh, Craig will, will walk us a little bit through what Samada does and why Samada may be considered a fourth generation uh, blockchain uh, infrastructure product yeah, to solve some of those, some of those problems. Um, then we'll have a break and um, then Christos Polisois and Yuri uh, Shirazen uh, will talk about what it actually takes to, on the technology side, to take crypto startups and to make crypto startups a reality. Yeah, so that goes both um, to financing, but also to code implementation. What, what steps have to be taken, in what phases, and what, what, <coughs> what procedural uh, implementation has to happen to make these a reality. Yeah, so that ties in many ways back to what Melinda is talking about, because all these projects are going through this. Yeah? And um, a lot of those projects have major architectural concerns. Yeah, so it's one thing to have a good idea to want to um, improve conditions for humanity with crypto technology, with crypto uh, blockchain technology. It's another thing to actually implement that. Yeah, so extremely valuable, what, what Christos will talk about is extremely valuable in that he actually breaks down for us what the stages are, and we'll use Samara as an example case, yeah, what the stages are and what you really have to, let me use the word nail down. A lot of people just keep moving and build something that they don't fully understand the implications of. Yeah? So you really have to, and Christos will, will walk us through this step by step. So, and then the last one uh, will be, we'll just talk about the, uh, the last panel at three, we'll just talk about verified reputation for the crypto evolution, meaning why, do, why does it make sense for crypto to have a, an infrastructure product that uh, uses verification procedures for decentralized autonomous systems? What does that mean? And why is it needed in crypto for the crypto evolution? And that would be it. Um, now, I already went way over the time allocations that I have. So let me uh, do a quick warm-up round, blockchain innovation and law. So very quickly, just to get everybody, so give everybody a base level of understanding. We'll talk a little bit about what's a blockchain, what is a smart contract. I will go through this very quickly because there's already very high level of uh, in, um, sophistication in this room. Then we will talk a little bit about whether law is actually compatible with crypto. Show of hands, please. Who in this room believes that the existing legal infrastructure can deal with the problems presented by crypto slash smart contracting, Ethereum contracting, and so forth? So let me simplify it, please. Is the existing legal infrastructure compatible with crypto? Show of hands. Nobody believes that. Everybody in this room believes that the existing legal infrastructure is incompatible with the crypto evolution. Okay, well, that's a good start. <laughs> uh, okay, so I will not get to corporate governance because it's just too much. We, we won't have time for it. And Mr. Abu Mayali, you cut me off when I, when I run out of time, please. Or give me a sort of a three-minute warning or so. Yeah? Okay, so Bitcoin. Everybody knows Bitcoin. Uh, everybody heard about it, uh, MSNBC, CNN, everybody, they're all trashing it. Oh, you know, it's just dangerous, yeah? uh, the dangerous Bitcoiners. Um, but most of us have heard of it and know that it's really just a, a value enhancement, a, 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 uh, a way of creating value um, by, by uh, so let, let, me, let me contrast it. So it's, it just holds value. It, it, Bitcoin doesn't have smart contracting functionality. Yeah, we can agree on this. 
Um, so, but everybody knows Bitcoin, and what's really under the waterline is everything we can build on top of the technology, yeah, with the technology. So folks are, are looking at, oh, yeah, um, <coughs> so we know Bitcoin, but understanding the underlying technology and what it enables and what, uh, what it can mean for society, yeah, that's, um, that's uh, if you want to label it that, that's the core of crypto. So they're, they're governance solutions, smart property, voting solutions, smart contracting, identity, crowdfunding, IoT, climate solutions. Yeah, so this is, for instance, climate, that's something that uh, Melinda will talk about. Yeah. So, <coughs> okay, what is the technology? I prefer this, uh, this definition by Vitalik Buterin. Blockchain is a magic computer that anyone can upload programs to and leave the programs to self-execute, where the current and all previous states of every program are always publicly visible and which carries a very strong crypto economically secured guarantee that programs running on the chain will continue to execute in exactly the way the blockchain protocol is described. Yeah? So what do we have? The core elements here, a, uh, well, he actually calls it a magic computer in, in this quote. Uh, so self-execution of programs, current and all previous states of every program are always publicly visible, so full transparency, and uh, crypto economically secured guarantees. Yeah, that's, that's, that's one way to, to look at this. So, uh, peek inside a sample block, somehow it's scrambled up there. Um, so the idea here is that you uh, hash print the content of each previous page, which this is where was this page block, whatever you want to call it, yeah, so if you compare this to a book, yeah, so the, the, the content of each previous page would be fingerprinted onto the next block. Yeah, so this block would contain the entirety of all the, the pages that were printed before because it's fingerprinted ha by hash, hash technology onto the additional uh, block. Yeah? Um, <coughs> okay, so when I teach, teach this, I always want to get people to the point of the green line here where people start realizing, so when they take my courses, I want them to get somewhere here, right? And they start realizing they really don't know enough. They need to learn this, yeah? Um, that's, that's what this really is about. And um, so, quick summary, um, sh we're talking about a shared ledger, yeah, so some people compare it to a, a global Google spreadsheet. Um, we, we're using cryptography, uh, there's a consensus uh, algorithm slash protocol, so con creating consensus of the nodes, and shared contracting. Yeah, so the idea is we have broader participation, lower cost, and increased um, efficiency. So, what have people compared this technology to? Yeah, so uh, there's a lot, as everybody knows in this room, there's a lot of hype over this. And um, about two years ago, I was, uh, I was very sort of opposed to all of the, the hype and the investments and people trying to make money for themselves. But ultimately, it all helps crypto, the crypto evolution. It doesn't matter why people are in crypto. What matters is that they participate, and the participation alone enhances the crypto, crypto world and with it come new solutions. So um, people have <coughs> compared it literally to basic human achievement, first flight, atomic energy, uh, first personal computer, um, moon landing, yeah? So uh, there are even some people who I hope jokingly compare the technology to or, or suggest that the technology was given to us by aliens, okay? So <laughs> jokingly, yeah? Okay, uh, as in how could humans possibly invent something like this? Okay, so the comparison I like is um, the internet era. So, um, what, what, so what, has the, what have the internet give, uh, years given us? Well, uh, personal communication, self-publishing, e-commerce, e social interactions, and so forth. Yeah? So 2015, with Ethereum um, being released, we, we see really this, um, this, this block blockchain promise materializing. So decentralized tr decentralization of trust, and value flow without intermediaries, so disintermediation. Uh, and I'm, I know I'm throwing a lot of <coughs> sort of uh, trigger words at, at folks, uh, we, and we can talk about every single one of them for hours. Yeah? So um, this, is, uh, this is just a summary if you like. Yeah? <coughs> okay, so tech trends. I would suggest that most of the tech trends that we've seen in the past few years are are related to and can be encapsulated by this technology or connected to, if you want to use those words. Yeah, some people are getting a little nervous when you say, say that. Um, but <coughs> so 
we just look at all the technology solutions that have been presented, they are really are connectors in almost every single area that we, we're looking at. Now, some people may say, and we have experts on Turing completeness here with uh, Christos Politzoyt. So Turing completeness, yeah? so any business logic that is, can be mathematically computed can be built on a blockchain. So out of that comes uh, connectivity to all these other tech trends. Yeah? So what if folks invested in the technology? So let me tell you this, according to some estimates, we're right now 10 times inflation adjusted at the level of investment we were in 1994 in the internet years, 10 times in this technology. Yeah? So arguably that, that, that has a meaning. And we now see more and more enterprises jumping on. So last year was a critical year, yeah? uh, both in terms of ICO fundraising, but also enterprise adoption, enterprise engagement, uh, testing of, of the product, and so forth. Yeah? Um, so what are these startups doing? <coughs> so we have, we all grew up in centralized systems, every single one here. Our children, my children, will very likely grow up in a networked, semi-networked society through this technology. That's, that I believe that, that that's where, where this is going. Yeah. We can talk about the bubble, yeah, and a lot of people in this room have some bubble concerns, but it doesn't, think about what happened with the internet bubble, 2000. Well, it gave us Twitter, Google, and so forth. Yeah. That's what we're talking about here. Even if you, and just to be clear, the crypto purists, they don't believe in the bubble. They believe that this is a sustainable new society yeah, that's being built here. Okay, so in the past, we've all been exposed to and grown up in a completely centralized systems. So let's take a, caps, a cap company. How, in the past, how, how did that work? Well, you had to call the operator. The operator would call the cab. The cab would drive, you, uh, drive, to, drive to your house and pick you up. That's completely centralized system. Um, they would pay their drivers, you would pay them, and the driver wouldn't necessarily be a, uh, an independent contractor. Yeah? So um, then things evolved, drivers became independent contractors, but with technology, Uber is starting to decentralize it. How? Well, Uber is now using technology to um, connect consumers and producers. In this case, the consumer is the person who wants to be driven, and the producer is the person who's driving. Yeah? The problem with this is what? With their model? Well, they're still an intermediary. They're still charging 25%. Now, to whom does, though, does, though, uh, uh, does that 25% belong? To all of you, the consumers and producers. That intermediary, we, we think they're necessary. We think that the Ubers of the world with technology are necessary. They, they should be charging us 25%. But if you believe in peer-to-peer -peer connectivity, in a peer-to-peer -peer society through technology, that 25% belongs to you, the consumers and the producers. Yeah? And that's what these startups, a large proportion of these startups, that's what they want to facilitate. Now, of course, they still have to be financially viable, right? So it's one thing for the ivory tower professor to talk about these, uh, these solutions and, and where society is going with, with the technology. <coughs> it's another thing for those uh, blockchain startups to actually be financially viable. Yeah? So until we get to the point where we, s we've s we see more and more of those startups materialize and be successful in the market, whether you believe in the, in the, in the bubble or not, yeah? the, the, this Decentralized future is not possible without those startups. Yeah? So, and the experimentation that goes into that, yeah? the experimentation with what solutions work, what solutions don't work, which of, which of those uh, startups have to be cleared out of the market, and they have to be cleared out, there's no doubt about it. Yeah? But the experimentation with all of those participants to figure out what works is necessary. There's no way around it. There, there is no evolution with, without it. Yeah? Okay. So, um, financial services landscape. Just to give you a sort of an uh, idea of how many there are, uh, and there's thousands and thousands um, around the world, um, and the reason why I'm showing you financial services landscape is because 
a lot of people are now actually saying this is too saturated a place. Everybody knows that blockchain is disrupting the financial services industry. So the, to the extent that you are a lawyer and you're servicing <coughs> the financial service industry, maybe that's one reason why you're here, because you start realizing that your clients are being disrupted by this. Yeah? Just to give you one data point, there is, uh, there's been a survey about uh, eight months ago, over 3,000 executives, on the question of how blockchain technology will be used in settlements, trading settlements. Yeah? So in the old days, uh, T plus five, unbelievable, right? Settler trade, T plus five. Now we're at T plus two. Blockchain technology, and I see Will now. Hello, Will. Sorry, I didn't see you before. Glad you're here. Um, blockchain technology can bring us to uh, lo ev lower this even further. Um, arguably, even close to instantaneous settlement. There are some issues uh, with that on the technology side, but because of latency and some other concerns. But it can bring, even T plus two can bring, that it can be brought down substantially. So that survey, we saw over 90% of executives surveyed saying that blockchain technology will be the exclusive technology for settlement purposes in the next three years. Three years, all of the trading settlement will be done on the blockchain. So it, yeah, that's, that's, that's that. Yeah, so it's a, it's a done deal on that end. Just to give everybody sort of a, um, an overview of the industry and, and what industries have, uh, have reacted most, mostly and di most, di most directly. So you, again, you see financial being the, the largest, bracket, lar largest bracket here. Um, also trading, number one, that's, that's what I just talked about. Uh, deal origination, I mean, we could go through all of those. And I could point you to a startup for every single one of those um, items. Yeah? Media is the same, insurance, part of finance, medical, uh, computer science, asset titles, government. Yeah? So, and, and Carla will talk more about uh, the government's perspective on this. Um, big problem is politics. And I'll uh, segue into that in a second. Do we re can, can this evolve in, in if centralized political processes are top-down controlling which and what technology will be used at what point in time? It's a real question here. Yeah? So there are uh, friends of mine <coughs> are politically involved. They are trying to, so there's, and there's a movement where folks are saying, no, 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 we have to go, we, this has to be done politically. We need to get polit political buy-in and democratic, exist in existing processes, uh, de democratic um, authorization to move ahead and implement these technologies. Yeah? So vehicle registration is one example. Yeah? Folks are very, are lobbying, um, uh, there, there are several lobby groups in, in Springfield now who are trying to get vehicle re registration on the blockchain. Same goes with uh, real estate title transfer on the blockchain. If you walk into the recorder of deeds office in Chicago, there's a big red sign up there that says, we use blockchain technology. Nobody knows how they're using it and how, whether that's true or not. How, I don't know, I mean, okay. But they have the sign out, yeah? So uh, that's, that's where things are going. Okay, so um, where, how am I on time? Good, okay. So big study. So this is not just Professor Carl rambling on about this, this happening, this, the OECD did a study on this. Yeah? Credit Suisse with OECD. So they estimated the adoption scenarios for global cross-value added migration to blockchain by industry and by country. Yeah, so I'm sorry it doesn't display really well, but if you just look at financialists here, um, wholesale, transportation, uh, accommodation, financial, uh, real estate, yeah? and then countries, United States, European Union, Japan, yeah? and <coughs> at the, at, in this slide, in uh, this um, column here, they look at, um, quote unquote, how blockchainable a given industry is. So the listed industries here, and here they're estimating how blockchainable that is, that industry. Yeah? On the high end, they estimate 100% for finance. Yeah? That means all of finance in this estimate on the high end, not the median. Yeah? The median is about 75 or so. All of it would be on the blockchain. Yeah? 
So just to give us, and this, this is a big study, uh, a big study uh, by uh, the OECD. And so I, I hope the, the, the meaning is clear, we have to take it seriously. Right? Um, and folks who, who still believe that they can ignore it, I think I, I personally believe it's a big mistake, but I, again, I teach coding for lawyers, I've been in this space for almost five years now, so um, uh, yeah, I'm biased. Uh, okay, so we don't have time for the smart contract thing. What's a smart contract? And why should we care? So automated ex uh, execution is sort of one item uh, that we can talk about. Um, <coughs> and I just, just actually taught a, um, a bet in a smart contract in my Coding for, for Lawyers uh, class, where as a very basic, simple illustration, I showed how a, a bet between two people can be coded in a solidity-based smart contract. Yeah. So, but for lawyers, um, the question becomes, why, why should lawyers need to know code to understand how these, these smart contracts work and, and what clients are may, may be doing with, with, with that technology? Yeah. So let's do a quick comparison of traditional contracts and smart contracts. So timing concerns. Once it's pre-coded, all you have to do is put the parameters into the contract and execute it. Yeah? Whereas in, in, um, in the real world, if you, if you want to use that, that terminology or in the existing uh, legal infrastructure, it takes often days to be able to contract and have a signed executed uh, version. Yeah? So this automation really lowers the, the time that it takes to get to, to execute a contract. Uh, we have manual remittance versus automatic remittance. Escrow may be necessary, whereas escrow is, the whole smart contract arguably can be seen as an escrow itself, yeah? because the, the deposit into the, con into the contract will not be released until the parameters of the smart contracts are fulfilled. That, that's sort of the, the definition of, er of, of the of escrow, except that we, do, we don't have a third party intermediary who holds and controls the escrow. Yeah? The technology does. Yeah? So because of those timing issues, because of uh, what's involved in, in contracting uh, today, co traditional contracts can be, in comparison, really, really expensive. Yeah? So folks who are looking at the technology and trying to figure out why to implement the technology, they're typically driven by transaction cost concerns. Um, and so often there's a sense of, you know, you don't want to miss the boat. That, that, that adds to it right now. Yeah? Uh, but that's, that's not as well informed, of course, a decision. Um, so most of folks who are, who are really contemplating it, um, they are doing it because they recognize that it's a, it's a prime use case for what they're doing and that we, they can substantially lower transaction costs. Yeah? And so the last point here is lawyers and the slide says lawyers may not be necessary. I actually disagree with this. I think lawyers will be necessary, but it will be lawyers who understand that technology, who understand how clients are using that technology and what they can and cannot do and where the lines are. Now that's, that's what we do as lawyers. We figure out where the line is and we walk the line in many ways. Okay, and so if you cannot interact with the technology, if you don't know the te understand the technology, I find it difficult to, to imagine that uh, law practices that involve transactions would, would be able to be maintained in the next five to 10 years. So you need to embrace it, in my opinion. There's no way around it, and I, I'll show you some, some data points that may illustrate why that's true. That may be true. Some people may disagree with that. So smart contracts, simple to complex. How much can we do with smart contracting today? How many people think we're somewhere here? So basic smart contracting, landlord remotely uh, locks uh, non-paying tenants out and so forth. Nobody? Hands, please. What's this? It's the top three. So you think we're somewhere here in terms of complexity of these smart contracts. Oh, you can't read it. Okay, I heard part three. Okay, 
So um, we have basic contracts, smart rights and obligations, digital value exchange, multi-party smart contracting, distributed au autonomous business units, distributed autonomous organizations, distributed autonomous government, and distributed autonomous society. Where are we? DAO, thank you, Carla. What's a DAO? So this may be a real shocker to a lot of people in this room, but we're here. We're somewhere here, right now, today. And this is two years, two years old. You can build this already. You can build a, an organization, an institution that has no registered offices, that is not subject to any jurisdiction, that purely exists in cyberspace and code. That it's already been done. Now, it failed miserably because um, it was a for-profit DAO, decentralized autonomous um, organization, where a, I would argue a white knight hacker um, showed the promoters, the, the developers in this case, that they had, who had set this up and coded it for free. This is a very idealistic notion. Yeah? They wanted to give this to society. Yeah? The hacker came in, but it, it, was a, it was not a donation DAO. It was a venture capital fund ba that basically um, facilitated the, the coordination of uh, technology enthusiasts to pool their resources and together decide where to allocate the resources, like a venture cap tech ven venture capital fund, only in cyberspace, yeah, without being subject to any jurisdiction. So what happened in this case of the, in the case of the DAO was that the people who set it up, the developers who coded it, and who coded it as uh, sort of idealists in this, they had overseen that you could allocate and send the revenue that the DAO received to a subsidiary account that nobody could control, including the hacker. Yeah? So they raised 180 million uh, in a month, largest crowdfunding campaign in, in, those, in, the, in those days. And about six months later, the hacker found a way to allocate $60 million into a subsidiary account that nobody could control. Yeah? So that's a failure. There's no doubt about that. Yeah? But important, important to recognize that it happened, it's possible. We're already there today. We're there. Yeah? So what are people doing now to, to get to the next stage to, to contemplate something like this? Yeah? Well, we now have donation DAOs where, where people don't use the DAO structure for capitalistic uh, endeavors. They use it as, an, as a donation uh, environment, yeah? meaning you are, you're decreasing incentives for materialistically motivated people to try and um, subver subvert the system. You let the system evolve, and once it evolves, and the protocols work, maybe we can get to the next stage. Yeah? That's, what, that's what this means. Now, I know this is all very idealistic, uh, but I'm trying to sort of paint a, a bigger picture here. Yeah? So, <coughs> what can blockchain do for regulation? Uh, three minutes, wow, okay. So, Let's distinguish internet transactions from crypto transactions. Just to give you sort of a sense why, why this is different and why the intersection of law and crypto in existing regulatory infrastructures may not work as well as some people may wish. Yeah. So internet transaction, we, this is ba it's basically emula emulating what we've done before. We know the counterparty, we know the ID, um, IP address. Yeah. There's accountability through identity. Payment details are known because the credit card details can be traced. We have traditional legal infrastructure applying and remedies in the existing legal infrastructure uh, coordinating uh, possible, possible fallout. Yeah? So you, you, can, you can go through the existing infrastructure, you can sue in court, uh, arbitration, whatever you want to do. Yeah? All of that is still applicable. Now let con con let's contrast this with the crypto transaction. Well, uh, virtual private networks and cryptography make parties, if they so choose, anonymous. I've had many debates with people wh that, who say that this may over time be diluted, and I think there's some, there's, that's correct, but for now, parties are anonymous. Yeah? So you don't know who you're, who you're contracting with if that party does not want to be, be known. Yeah? You also don't know 
and you cannot, uh, you, you cannot trace the payment details. So the parties are unknown, and you can't trace the payment details. You, you can only see where the, where the money ended up, um, or you can only see the, the wallet address in this case. So what does that mean? Well, we have smart contracts that are self-regulating, self-executing, without the ability of existing courts to identify who the parties are, what they do, and without the ability to necessarily trace the payments that we can otherwise trace in the existing system. So the result of that is that we see in, for crypto transactions, millions and millions of dollars lost. <coughs> Terrible fraud happening in that system. There's no question about that. Just ICOs alone. Uh, I, I could give you so many examples where, where fraud very clearly happens. How many of those cases end up in our existing court system? I ran the research, uh, I, I ran the federal and state databases four or five months ago. Seven cases. Seven cases that had in dicta mentioning of crypto relevant contracts, yeah, based on keyword searches. Seven cases, dicta, not on point. Yeah? That has changed now, there's some cases out, but it's still very, very small, extremely small, for, I wanna argue, billions of dollars lost in this system, where people have no remedies. So th to me, that means there's a disconnect between the two. There's a disconnect between the existing legal infrastructure and the way crypto and the crypto economy evolves. So Carla will talk a little bit about where we're going with that yeah, and what, what folks are, are talking and, and looking at. So, um, and this is just an illustration. So look at the Ethereum transaction amount. A, a huge proportion of those transactions, the code has bugs, parties are not getting what they want, ICOs are, are fraud, and so forth and so forth. None of them end up in our court system. There's something wrong, yeah? And so the question then becomes, how do you fix that? Th that's what I, I'm working on, yeah? So uh, to tell you up front, um, Samada can, can, can build a distributed jurisdiction. And so Craig Calcaterra and, and Christos Politzois, they will talk a little bit more about the implementation um, issues. I'm, I, I got to this through this, the recognition that we have a disconnect between the existing legal infrastructure and the crypto evolution. Yeah. So to me, what's needed is a distributed jurisdiction, meaning we need something that, um, that supplements the existing legal infrastructure, and that is an intra-blockchain technology solution, law, legal solution. Yeah. I'll end here, thank you. thanks a lot. We'll, we'll move on to Carla. Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Carla Rees. Professor Rees is currently a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University and a visiting assistant professor of law at Stetson University College of Law. Prior, teaching, prior to teaching law, Professor Rees practiced law as an associate in the blockchain technology and digital currency industry group at Perkins Coy. A Fulbright Scholar, her current research focuses on the intersections of blockchain technology and the law, theorizing about the technology from a commercial and corporate law perspective. Her most recent article, If Rockefeller Were a Coder, was selected as a winning paper in the 2018 Southeastern Association of Law Schools Call for Paper Competition. Please join me in welcoming Professor Carla Rees. Can you hear me? Now? Okay. Um, thanks very much for having me uh, and for organizing the conference. Um, even as Professor Call talked about there being a 
sort of disconnect between the existing legal system and the things that you can do with blockchain technology. Government agencies and governments around the world are trying to figure out how to adopt blockchain technology for their own purposes to leverage their efficiencies and make law more effective. Um, I'm going to drop what I would what would be a footnote here in a law review article and just say I'm going to use probably the term blockchain technology colloquially, knowing that um, the realm of the technology is much broader than that, right? And we could argue about distributed ledger technology versus blockchain and permission systems versus um, public ones. I'm not going to do that in a um, what I would normally do in a very long, nearly a page long footnote in a paper. Um, just know I know there's a difference. I'm just going to use the word blockchain probably because that's what you do when you're talking, um, right? So um, in any event, when you're looking at what governments are doing around blockchain technology, sometimes they're thinking about trying to bridge this disconnect that you talked about. Sometimes they're just trying to figure out how to make law better, right? How to make their regulatory processes better. But in any event, things that have been going on around the world include Sweden and Cook County, Illinois, trying to use blockchain technology to record real property um, and change their real property registries. A company or a, a nonprofit, perhaps, called Bitland in Ghana is trying to do the same thing, in particular to pr protect vulnerable populations. Uh, Dubai wants a fully smart government operating on the blockchain, right? Um, the Department of Health and Human Services here in the United States has been looking at blockchain technology for the protection of health data for quite some time. Um, it's unclear if they've gotten anywhere with that, but they have been looking at it for quite some time. Um, and before it got drowned out in all of the initial coin offering uh, news cycles, the CFTC had announced that it planned to investigate ways to use blockchain to enhance CFTC functions and perhaps develop quote unquote regulator nodes on distributed ledgers. Delaware, of course, maybe getting the most uh, news cycle about its efforts, um, has launched a system for uh, filing UCC1 uh, filings. And if you're not a secure transactions per person, that's the filing that says you took out a loan on a specific piece of collateral to let all the other um, secured lenders know about that in the future. They've developed a system for filing those on the blockchain, which in my world of teaching secure transactions is huge because it would solve a ton of problems we have um, with making the system function as it is. Um, they've also, of course, amended their general corporation law to allow corporations to uh, maintain their share registries on blockchain technology. And uh, Vermont is considering a law right now that would allow business entities that fully operate on the blockchain, these DAOs that Professor Call introduced you to, um, to become LLCs, or depending on the topic of their business, to become business trusts, um, I think particularly in the context of identity trusts. Um, this list could continue on and on for a majority of the time that I have slated to speak with you as governments everywhere are thinking about how they might adopt blockchain technology for their own internal processes to administer law, to enforce law, to implement existing law. Um, they're also thinking about, like Vermont, how to encourage private properties or private parties to um, leverage blockchain technology in their own um, relationships with each other around, for example, business entities operating on the blockchain. But in general, you get my point. There is a lot of people working on how to solve this problem of integrating the existing legal structure with blockchain technologies. The question that I explore in my research is what effect will such integration have on the existing legal system more broadly? Right? And maybe, as Professor Call points out, maybe disruption is necessary in the existing legal system, and it's something that we should welcome. But my discussion of that is that we should expect ripple effects that we aren't expecting right now. And to the extent that we are building these systems and integrating them into the existing legal system, we have to think about those ripple effects and the potential downsides of them. So to begin, Larry Lessig right, famously talked about code as being law. Code is law. Not the way the DAO people meant in that the code was literally the contract. That's not quite what he was getting at. He meant that code is law because it's a form of regulatory power that constrains or enables activity in uh, cyberspace, right? It decides what you can do in the system. Uh, we can therefore think of computer code, including the computer code that is used to build blockchain-based systems as a type of foreign law. If we do that, when we um, think about moving or integrating our existing legal system with the computer code, what we're actually doing is transplanting our current legal rules to a, a foreign legal system. 
And comparative law scholars, for a very long time, have taught us how to think about uh, what happens when you transplant law to a foreign system, right? Um, <coughs> so for example, when you do implement UCC Article 9 filing system through a blockchain-based filing system, what is, the, what is the effect, the ripple effects, for the rest of Article 9? What happens to all those rules that I teach my students about what, uh, an ineffective filing, an improper filing, that can no longer be made improperly? The system won't let you enter a form that's improperly uh, filled out, right? So the rules that we have to learn for the bar are no longer necessary. What do we do with them, right? Wouldn't that be fantastic? Don't have to learn them anymore. Um, in any event, thinking through those um, ripple effects are important when integrating law and blockchain technology. Uh, and I talk about or use the word crypto law as um, up on the slide here, not to talk about the crypto wars that happened in like the 90s um, and the cases around that, but really um, to, to refer to a new area of emerging legal discourse, sort of an emerging jurisprudence resulting from transplanting law into blockchain-based systems. Um, I've argued in a recent paper that um, we should expect six specific ripple effects uh, to happen in the source system, or in the, would namely our legal system, as we integrate the existing system with blockchain technology. First, we would expect to find opportunities to simplify existing sub substantive law, like these rules in Article 9, for example. We also may see the emergence of new regulatory actors, if not formally, at least informally, right? So in particular, Lessig talks about the role of coders in shaping the system. And if the code is the law, if it constrains your ability to act or enhances your ability to act or incentivizes your, your types of actions, so you could think in the blockchain system, double spending is constrained, right? Mining is incentivized, uh, and, you, and smart contracting is enhanced, yeah? So if the coders building the system have the ability to structure and decide what activity is enhanced and what activity is prohibited, they are in, in effect, wielding regulatory power. Whether they are officially dubbed a regulator or not, they are Im impacting uh, the scope of regulation in the system. We might also expect to see some disruption of established patterns of enforcement and uh, related regulatory policy choices. So if smart contracts enable automatic enforcement, maybe there is less uh, enforcement to actively be done. Um, <coughs> We might also expect um, transplants to disrupt choices in how our lawmakers think about building the law. So Anthony Casey and Anthony Niblett have a couple of papers out about um, the choice between rules and standards. So building, building specific rules that, um, like a code for people to live by versus a standard that you interpret and apply on a case-by-case -case basis. And they say, in general, machine learning and other algorithm-based technology as it's integrated into the law will push people, push lawmakers towards more rules and away from standards because they can be more specific and they can be, they can and um, enumerate more of them, right? Cover more of the possible uh, types of scenarios with the rules. Uh, similarly, I would think that integrating uh, blockchain technology and the existing law might have a similar effect as the ones that Casey and Niblett are discussing. Um, finally, we might see uh, legal transplants from existing law into blockchain technology reduce law lag, so bring the law in the books more in harmony with the law as it actually operates in the world, in part because of the automatic enforcement um, piece of smart contracts. And finally, um, we should expect that legal culture will shift from a center of gravity where the lawyers have a significant influence on the way of law is interpreted and implemented to a uh, center of gravity where the coder is developing the system have more of an effect on the legal culture um, that results from it. <clears throat> so today, I want to drill down specifically on two of the potential ri ripple effects. Software developers yielding regulatory power when law is implemented through blockchain technology, and a potential shift in the culture around how society interacts, understands, and views generally the law. So research by Professor Lynn Lepucky uh, talks about how at present, lawyers play a significant role in determining how the law in the books is interpreted and implemented in real life law and action. Um, in his article, Legal Culture, Legal Strategy, and the Law in Lawyers' Heads, Professor Lepucky explores the idea that the actual implementation of the law and the experience of those subject to the rules 
vary significantly by community, right? So local rules on how you access the courts, uh, local rules on how the case proceeds through the system, um, local ideas of what fair negotiation is or how you would interpret uh, the rules under the general corporate law. Uh, all vary by community because each community has a separate legal culture and that legal culture is influenced heavily by the local bar. If instead, <coughs> uh, if instead uh, as we implement law through code, including through blockchain technology code, uh, those that develop and write the code will yield significant power on how to shape uh, the way that people experience the law. More power, perhaps, than the lawyers and the law in the lawyer's head. So, for example, uh, Karen Levy and Jeremy Skullcroft have uh, asked and researched whether smart contracts, uh, when used as part of a long-term contractual relationship, um, have a, it's sort of a clash with what people think of as relational contract theory, right? So, in general, long-term con contractual relationships between uh, parties uh, have sort of a flexible nature to them, right? You expect things to change over time and you don't want that to kill, kill the deal and go back and have to redo your giant master contract um, each, you know, every two years or something. Sometimes you do and that's what you have to do. But um, it, there is flexibility through uh, sort of uh, industry practice or practice between the parties, right, to shape and change the course of uh, execution of the contract. What happens to that when you integrate smart contracts into that contractual relation relationship and flexibility is lost? Um, and you can, it's hard to call the smart contracts back, right? Um, similarly, as blockchain technology applications like Aragon explore potential for decentralized dispute resolution mechanisms, what impact will there be on litigants' discovery rights or their basic opportunities to be heard? Um, University of Virginia School of Law professor George Geese in his new article, Traceable Shares and Corporate Law, explores ripple effects of blockchain-based share registries. So it seems simple enough. Uh, Delaware, um, the Delaware judge said, uh, if, if we could just use blockchain technology, we'd be able to trace who specifically owns what part of the company at which time. And this problem that we have in his case, which was, uh, to the extent you don't know, uh, a case um, involving Dole, where um, they couldn't tell who actually owned the shares of the company at issue, and thus they could not actually tell who was entitled to um, parts of the settlement, right? There were more claimants than there were actual shares involved, and they could not, uh, even with the help of the DCCC, decide who was the actual owners, right? Um, and so he says, if we just had blockchain technology in a footnote, we could solve this problem, and we wouldn't need, um, we wouldn't, have a question of more claims to ownership than actual shares in existence. And so indeed, the uh, legislature responded, and now you can have share registries on the blockchain, right? Well, in his article, Professor Geese um, argues that traceable shares, more than just being uh, efficient and convenient and allowing you to know specifically who owns what at any given time, will also have ripple effects into corporate law more broadly. He expects traceable shares to change the structure of shareholder lawsuits, alter the al allocation of corporate governance rights, and require broader recalibration of the principles of shareholder responsibility for corporate activity, particularly negative corporate activity. So if you can be more um, actively involved as a shareholder in corporate action through blockchain technology, whether it be via voting rights that you can uh, uh, exercise more easily, or through greater exercise of your ownership, um, then perhaps you need to have more responsibility for uh, the corporate actions. In my own cur current work, I continue to explore this phenomena of companies organizing themselves to operate entirely on the blockchain, and sometimes, or I encourage them to anyways, to organize under state law that would give them, give participants limited liability and give the entity perhaps autonomous personhood, right? Autonomous corp uh, corporate personhood. Um, I'm interested in what the impact will be for corporate culture and for the way that we understand in the law the nature of the corporation and doing business more broadly. <coughs> this, all of these strands of research then explore variations of the ways that the work of software developers in building blockchain systems for regulation purposes actually um, imbues in the software developers power uh, in the legal system to shape the legal system and the way people are affected by existing law. This power of software developers to influence the answers to very important legal and jurisprudential questions in turn will be constrained or enhanced by the system 
that is chosen to govern decision making relating to how you update or change the system itself that the governments have adopted. So in the public blockchain space, there is an ongoing debate about the future of blockchain governance. Um, when government agencies adopt blockchain-based systems, they are likely to adopt permissive systems for a variety of reasons, right? And uh, in fact, um, so for example, Delaware uses Symbiant, which is a permission system, not a completely public blockchain. Um, <clears throat> to the extent that other government agencies do the same, that will leave decisions about how to update the system, how to implement governance um, in general over the system entirely to the op adopting agency and its service provider, right, say Symbiant. So should, the questions then become, should decisions about how to govern the underlying protocol that they're using to implement law, should those be put to a notice and comment period? Should the general public who is, uh, go, whose legal rights will be affected by Im using this system have a say in how the system is governed and changed going forward? And if so, what does that look like? Is there some kind of democratic oversight mechanism that we can implement? Um, how, if at all, does the research around embedded bias and discrimination in algorithms uh, in the law, um, when used in the law, right, so say in the context of um, criminal sentencing or in the smart city literature, how does that research uh, port over to the use of blockchain-based code in legal systems, if it does at all? Um, but it's something we need to consider because of the um, sort of magnitude of legal rights that potentially could be affected. These are big, important questions. They will impact the core individual legal rights that we experience every day. And blockchain technology at whatever level, whether it's government agencies using it or private parties using it to uh, implement their corporation, um, will be impacted. They are questions that ultimately may in fact impact, uh, be expected to impact the practice of law and at some level, legal education more broadly. I don't have many of the answers to the questions I've posed for you today, but the point here is that we are shaking foundations by tra transplanting a legal system, the existing legal system into blockchain-based technology, ostensibly just to make it more efficient or to make it, um, uh, uh, more, um, more efficient and more, um, what's the other word I'm looking for? Yeah, that too. <laughs> Transparent and more efficient. Um, but in any event, by doing it, we are shaking foundations that we haven't thought about, right? We haven't fully considered the ramifications. And if we're going to move forward in this way by implementing the existing legal system through blockchain technology, we need to do so intentionally and with caution, having considered the ripple effects and how we want to mitigate undesirable ones. Is there a question period? Yeah, so I'm open to questions if you have them. And if not, I will take a seat. Sam, we'll hit you next. Uh, hi, so my name is Dan Dosh. I'm a third year student here about to graduate. Um, we've talked a lot about implementation and adoption of blockchain and cryptocurrencies in general. I'm curious, because the technology seems so abstract and ethereal to newcomers, and the newcomers are typically in centralized systems like local government and whatnot, what do you see as the most practical, realistic on-ramps for, say, like Hennepin County, other small government or small units of governments or corporations even, what are the most practical on-ramps to getting involved in this space? So the simple back, in, back office operations, right? So Delaware's um, first started by implementing their state archives, a uh, state archive system in, uh, on blockchain technology. And that just opened the door for exploring the use of the technology and how much it would cost and building the system. And by starting small like that with just your archives and record retention rules, um, they were able to then build on top of that system for the Article 9 filing system, right? So it becomes dual purpose, but start with something small and easily thought of as sort of um, clearing out uh, files, for example, uh, use it for its database architecture first and then, and then see what you can do um, bigger with it. Exactly, yeah. So this is Delaware and so forth. All the systems where government-based entities 
are starting to use the technology. Ultimately, you, you're, you're saying this exactly the, the way I see it, is they still hold control mm. over what changes are made in those systems. Yes. So it's not, it's, it's just a use of the technology to, to utilize its positive effects on certain outcomes without subscribing to the decentralized philosophy that is inherent in the, in the technology. Yes, depending on, so in the United States, predominantly, yes, right? But so the Bitland effort in Ghana, not as much, right? They're trying to integrate on the public blockchain. But generally speaking, in the United States, yes. It, okay, Permission that's systems, okay yeah. exactly. So then the question becomes, is this sustainable? Can, uh, so they can, anybody can build a private chain and control it, yeah? But is, is experimenting with this technology in private chains ultimately leading governments to let go, or are they just still exercising, to, through existing democratic processes, control over the outcomes and protocols in those systems? So as to sustainability, I think it depends on use case. So for example, Illinois Cook County um, looked at real recording, real property recording structures and said, never mind, because it would be too expensive, <laughs> right? So uh, it is a, an expensive endeavor, uh, depending on what it is you're looking to do. And maybe the hype about efficiencies and such is just that. So you have to figure out what the use case is and whether it's really a blockchain technology use case. I think the best example that I've seen for it being is the ones in Delaware, right? So the Article 9 system, and in fact, the, uh, the paper, came first, I have to say, paper came first, um, that says you should reform the Article 9 system using blockchain technology because smart contracts can get rid of some of these really arcane rules that we have to learn for the bar, right? Um, and just make the system more predictable. And similarly, for the reasons Professor Gee says, traceable shares would be phenomenal. Those are two, I think, areas where if the benefits are really reaped, it will just spread like across the states, right? Those are both state-based systems. I think you could expect state-by-state state adoption, which would make it sustainable. What is ultimately needed to get more government buy-in? Out loud? API? APIs, so that you don't have to work directly with the vendor to build your own thing. Yeah, I think that that's one, yeah. You gotta make it okay, more cost-effective, right? So cook that's a tech answer. Well, you, mean you have to make it more cost-effective is what that goes to. You have to make it easier, more cost-effective, so that you're not co Cook County walking away. I also think, um, mm, I think that the governments have to expect innovation in ways that, that bypass um, filing articles of incorporation altogether. So, and if Rockefeller were a coder, I argue, you don't need that. You just become, you just organize as a business trust and you don't have to file anything. And you still get the benefits of, of being a corporation, benefits and responsibilities of being a corporation, um, but no need to Okay, let me be a purist. In person. Let me be a purist. Governments, and I'm oversimplifying this, but governments are paranoid about the implications of the use of the technology if the technology can lead to a fully decentralized society. Because then the government has no role, right? So the question then becomes, if the, gov if the majority of ins different government entities look at this differently. So central banks, for instance, all of the world, uh, world central banks, 43% are already exper experimenting with Ethereum solutions. They're on <laughs> cryptocurrencies, yeah? So, but let's, let's say that, as a purist w would look at this, that the te technology poses a threat to the very existence of government and democratic processes that we all grew up in because the technology facilitates another solution, right? So then the question becomes, would, would it be in the government's interest to suppress the technology and implementation of the technology? And there are different people have different answers to that. Now, one thing that I want to point out is that if we want government, true government adoption, I think the solution has to be taxing. We need to get governments, and there, there are governments around the world that are dealing with this all, already. So I've been advising uh, Cayman and various other jurisdictions on this. They are already, through their lobbyists on the government level, are now saying, well, the solution is we need to be able to use the technology to tax. Because once they use it uh, to tax, <laughs> they, they perpetuate it, um, 
and they use it themselves, they see the efficiencies, and they're guaranteeing their own existence. I'll stop here. Got it. So like to combat tax fraud, you mean, or to, to collect taxes using an automated oh. system, yeah. Oh. Oh. That's a great use case, so that goes to the, maybe not a low state stakes um, first implementation, but an implementation that makes you money, makes the government money, absolutely. There's a question here, right behind, oh. Oh, sorry, I, I will get this one. So uh, I'm Jason Wu, currently working on a blockchain startup. So my question is, you know, in the traditional legal world, like uh, different uh, territory or country or region, they have different uh, regulation. But uh, for this next generation of law system, do you think that will be uh, the, the next law system still? Because uh, I believe, you know, it's so hard to identify where the criminal happens, you know, in the cryptocurrency world. How do you deal with the, you know, the different region if we have different law system? How can you, you, you know, enforce the law? Yeah, so I should make a new, another disclaimer. I'm not a cyber separatist. I don't, um, so there's this debate about uh, how does jurisdiction uh, for conduct that happens on the internet um, uh, get applied has been happening since the internet, right? Uh, whether you're John Perry Barlow versus um, others, uh, I, I am not a cyber separatist. I think governments can and will continue to er assert their jurisdiction extraterritorially. We've seen that here, right? Um, they're not going to stop doing that. I think that new systems like um, Aragon and perhaps the, the system that you were speaking about earlier, which I'm not familiar with, may offer alternatives that you can use on a sort of private contracting you know, decide to use that system. I'm not sure um, how governments will adopt it or co-opt it or try to, but, um, but I'm, uh, people certainly are working to make alternatives, but I don't think those alternatives will stop anytime soon governments from uh, applying their jurisdiction extraterritorially. They're, they've been doing it in the space since 2012, right? So um, that's not gonna change anytime soon. Uh, it means, so, so for example, in the United States, um, it started with the money transmission laws, right? It's where I cut my teeth in this space as a uh, um, uh, electronic financial services lawyer at Perkins. Um, the laws are that in, in, if you offer essentially any um, money transmission services, anything that qualifies as money transmission services to people in the United States, whether you are located and organized abroad or not, um, if, it, if that activity touches um, people in the United States or you take money from people in the United States, even if your activities happen entirely uh, outside the jurisdiction of the United States, um, you fall under the laws and you have to comply. And if you don't, they will come after you. Um, the prime example, I think, is Liberty Reserve, right? Liberty Reserve, everybody forgets about them. They were a centralized virtual currency. They were a company in Costa Rica and their principal um, uh, executive officers were five uh, folks that lived around the world. Uh, the Department of Treasury decided that the stuff that Liberty Reserve was doing um, was uh, money transmission and it uh, coordinated with folks all around the world to arrest those five executive officers and prosecute them from, uh, for unlawful money transmission. That's an example of um, the use of extraterritorial jurisdiction. Um, yeah. Well, so I think uh, to the point earlier about the ICO um, uh, prosecutions, they're just starting. That's why you didn't find anything four to five months ago. But like yesterday, Massachusetts, for example, uh, put out f four consent decrees. Like they're going after folks and they don't care if your uh, organization that issued the ICO um, is actually technically a Cayman's company or whatever. If you sold to people in the United States and you committed fraud in the United States, they will come after you. I have one more question from this gentleman here who's been trying very patiently to <laughs> ask a question.
But you, so there's, yeah, there's one is sandboxing, which, which is particular, I think, though, to financial services applications, right? So where the regulations are super heavy, governments, not very much in the United States, but governments elsewhere have created sandboxes, right? In, in the government's defense, right? So they, so they tried initially, so it, uh, I didn't like it. it. It didn't go well for them. But so if you think about the Treasury's FinCEN guidance in 2013, it, they didn't just issue it with no discussion. They did reach out to industry uh, members. It's not clear which industry members, because they ended up creating uh, terms that nobody used in the industry. But the thought was that they reached out to industry members to try and get input on the guidance. And then right afterwards, they were very open, much more open than the SEC has been. We, I mean, I was on calls with them trying to figure out what they meant with the guy. Like, they were trying to explain. They weren't, so not that it was a good outcome, but they thought that they were doing that, right? And then there's the OCC FinTech Charter which has gone nowhere, not because of the OCC, maybe in part the scuttlebutt on the inside is that um, it was never intended to be a real thing, right? They were never gonna give it to anybody. But then you have the state, um, Conference of State Banking Supervisors suing to prevent it from happening so they don't lose their licensing revenues, right? It's just complicated here. They just took forever. Uh, they, like, it took too long and people couldn't wait. Yeah, there's that too, and people and people couldn't wait, so they use their their um, political capital to pass laws that weren't that, and they're not going to do it again, basically, to adopt the uniform law now. How's this? <laughs> okay. Give the technology lawyer old school technology. Um, I, I would say, um, as a practitioner uh, in the financial regulatory space for uh, 25 years now, uh, in the financial uh, technology space for uh, slightly less than that, I'm, I'm a little bit more positive about the the role that. Uh, uh, regulation in play, uh, even in the U.S. that has, uh, I would agree with Wolf, a um, Byzantine and probably unnecessarily categorical approach to regulation uh, in the space. Um, I, I'm representing a couple of clients currently in ICOs, um, and I, I believe uh, uh, fervently that they have good intentions and one of the things that we talk a lot about is uh, legitimate design of the token uh, and so I was somewhat discouraged to read a, a market piece a few days ago uh, from a, an entity called Satis Group which is actually a, a registered broker dealer that operates in the a token space in the US who concluded 81 percent of ICOs in the first quarter of this year so this quarter uh, constituted frauds. That's a pretty high number uh, for, uh, it, it's, it's unclear, right? It, 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 it's just, it, it's an eight page market analysis. Uh, so I uh, don't know what goes 
in into to that, but as a practitioner in the space that likes to think that we've evolved beyond sort of the simplistic, um, I'm putting up a website and collecting $20 million from people all over the world, uh, it, it, a statistic like that I think gives us all uh, reason for pause. Uh, and uh, you could argue that in our system um, where uh, there's an active plaintiff's bar that uh, plaintiff's lawyers will effectively police uh, frauds. There are already uh, rescission actions in action for damages against ICO issuers um, that uh, perhaps you don't need uh, regulators, but I continue to believe that there is a, a very good place for regulatory authority and coordinated regulatory action uh, in the face of a fraudulent activity, particularly where it, where it's rampant. Now, as a practitioner, where it can be frustrating is um, when you have what you think is a legitimate business come to you uh, and uh, tell you that they'd like to raise money uh, in a token offering uh, and um, being uh, uh, unable to provide them with concrete guidance as to how they can legally sell uh, tokens in the United States unless they want to limit uh, the token offering to accredited investors. And there I think there's a pretty uh, clear, um, clear path. Yes. Well, so, so, so let's talk about that because we feel like we're serious uh, about it. Uh, Reg A plus is certainly theoretically available. Uh, do, do you have any reason to believe that it's actually available for uh, a, a, a token issuer? Okay, very, very good. Right. So, in, in the uh, in the the U.S. system, uh, you're pr you're presumed to be required to register with the SEC unless there's an exemption. Uh, broadly speaking, um, the exemption that most people uh, rely upon uh, is a private placement exemption or Regulation D. Uh, previously, that required that uh, you uh, offer uh, without means of general solicitation and to the extent that you offered to individuals that uh, uh, were not accredited investors, uh, so meaning you had a, a million dollar net worth or two hundred or three hundred thousand uh, dollars of income depending upon whether it was individual or collected with your spouse uh, there were additional information requirements so there was something in the law that was designed to protect non-accredited investors on a private basis that exemption was expanded a few years ago uh, to permit uh, general solicitation offerings which some folks refer to as 506 C um, after the uh, the actual uh, provision of the regulation, um, th that permits uh, general solicitation so you can actually put up a website and collect money, uh, uh, providing that you only sell to accredited investors and you comply with the uh, enhanced verification requirements of the rule, among other things, uh, which requires not that you just take people's word uh, for the fact that they're accredited investors, uh, but you get a uh, third party, uh, one of a number of selected third parties to verify your accredited investor status. You can also submit tax returns, although I've not actually seen anybody provide personal t tax information to somebody that they want to invest in. It's a, a bit of a, a strange animal. Um, this gentleman just referred to Regulation A+, plus, which I agree is sort of the, the new territory. Um, uh, so Regulation A+, plus is, is uh, somewhat between a uh, exemption and a registration. It requires filing of an information statement uh, with the SEC and requires that the SEC uh, deem your offering qualified. So there is some measure of substantive uh, qualification there, but it's uh, certainly the SEC would tell you uh, much less than a registration statement. Uh, and the financial statement requirements are, are much more flexible. Many uh, startup companies actually cannot uh, satisfy the financial statement requirements for registration. So Regulation A-plus is theoretically available to um, 
uh, quite a few additional issuers. Uh, so I think it's a very promising suggestion to consider Regulation A+. Plus. The question uh, that I think I have uh, in my practice uh, is, um, you know, I have to advise a client that that filing in, in that process is probably two to 250, two, $200,000, $250,000. Um, and I can't actually uh, promise them that they're gonna get out of the SEC. And, and I can't even point to an issuer uh, that's issued tokens that has gotten out of the SEC. Uh, a, a, and uh, so uh, when you ask clients, um, certainly we're advising clients to follow the law, but when you're, but when you're asking clients how they're gonna spend their scarce resources, uh, I think you have to uh, present uh, the reg A plus alternative to them in, in that cost benefit uh, rubric. So uh, you can spend the money and you, you, may, you may be qualified. Uh, I actually think that's the right answer for um, companies that need to have a retail uh, component as part of their operation. So if you want your token ultimately to be utilized by consumers in the U.S., you've got to figure out some means of, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, it's a, it, it, it's a fair point, um, and what you're seeing in the marketplace right now is, is actually a, a number of the um, um, uh, registered uh, crowdfunding platforms, and I forget the technical name for that, I apologize. Uh, uh, regulation, regulation crowdfunding is, is the regulation, but you have to go through a designated platform, and that has a, that has a technical term. Uh, you, you see those uh, folks as well as um, um, uh, registered uh, BDs uh, promoting Reg A plus offering and, and uh, crowdfunding offerings. Th that's that's also a, a possibility. The amounts that you can uh, raise there are relatively small for the the effort that's required, and the financial statement requirements are actually uh, somewhat more burdensome uh, in the CF context than in in the Reg A. Uh, plus context, but I, I agree with you that that's an option that somebody should consider, uh, particularly where the essence of their uh, their token it requires consumer trading uh, in the U.S. Because you have to figure out some way to get there at, at some point, and at this point, the SEC um, uh, is offering that as the most promising option and has essentially. Uh, indicated that if you do anything else in the U.S., uh, that you're subject to hindsight guessing. And as an issuer, you have to uh, bet that even if the SEC were to decide that uh, you, had, you were properly qualified, that you receive at least one lawsuit from a plaintiff's uh, firm looking to, uh, to collect on a, a some kind of rescission offering. And, and so, Uh, no, I mean it. it yeah, I, I'm con I'm contemplating. Um, well, first of all, yes, I do believe people will be sued, even if they've limited the offering only to accredited. It's a different question whether or not you'd win the lawsuit. Uh, but I, I think I as an issuer, when you make uh, your investment decision about which way you go, you have to uh, calculate that you're going to have some level of cost at this point to responding to one or more suits, even if you think you can win, uh, a and a uh, regulatory inquiry, uh, which um, perhaps goes well t in the direction that, that you were starting to talk about, which is considering excluding U.S. consumers altogether and focusing your offering uh, outside of the U.S. and really only using the U.S. as a market for capital raising uh, because you're limiting yourself to accredited investors and focusing on uh, consumers uh, in, in in other jurisdictions. Um, 
to the question about carrots and sticks, because this all this complication in the sandboxing is all around financial services applications of the technology. If you look outside of financial services applications of the technology, I'm hopeful that you will see more cooperation or what um, the literature variously describes as co-regulation or dynamic regulation. I think an example of this, and I'm hopeful with an example that will migrate over to the US is in the area of content regulation. Um, so uh, Europe, uh, the European Commission, right, the, um, with the GDPR coming into force, um, there's a paper out by Michelle Fink that talks about um, the potential problems with blockchain technology and the GDPR, um, the ways that it's basically impossible to comply. And so the European Commission is actively working with industry to come up with a way to comply with GDPR. And then similarly, the question about content, illegal content that, content that has come up as a result of a paper issued or circulated in the last week or so. Um, I think that issue will spark um, maybe cooperative thoughts um, and among US regulators too. Content regulation is typically an area where we've been more cooperative because of free speech um, counterbalances, right? Thing, concerns we don't have to counterbalance financial regulation. I mean, so are you saying that you think Airbnb and Uber got olive branches? No. Okay, because <laughs> that's, yeah, because they didn't, right? Right, but they're enormously successful unicorns, right? Um, despite that, and I think the difference is they're not financial service regulation, right? It's a different application, no financial service regulation stuff to deal with. And you mess this up, you go to jail, right? You mess up the taxi law, maybe not so much. You said like that's how they became unicorns was by circumventing regulation. I don't think I understand. So I don't think they are interacting differently. So A, I think that it's not decentralized. Like you said earlier, I don't think Uber and Airbnb are actually decentralized technologies. They are centralized platforms that enable peer-to-peer -peer exchange, but they're still a centralized intermediary. So they're the Liberty Reserve version of sharing economy, right? Um, but I also, I don't think they've gotten any olive branches whatsoever, um, but they've succeeded where Bitcoin companies have failed because they don't go to jail if they break a taxi law, right? And you go to jail for a long time for unlicensed money transmission or um, I assume unregistered sales of securities, um, that you, there are criminal pen penalties as well as civil, yes. Yeah. Um. Right, and, th and those, uh, I actually think that's an advancement in the conversation because most people now have heard of the Howey test. Um, it, and it was very difficult a number, uh, say a year ago, to explain uh, to, to people um, in other countries that uh, the technology that they were interested in deploying in the U.S. was actually going to be regulated pursuant to case law, which is not a thing in, in a number of jurisdictions. And it was case case law that was developed at a time when there there weren't really computers, uh, and um, it, it, people reacted. Well, that's a very anachronistic, uh, anachronistic system. Um, you, you know, I uh, I actually have the 
the pleasure of representing a company in the in the gig economy space, uh, and, and so I do have some thoughts on uh, whether gig economy companies have effectively disintermediated uh, regulation. Um, my my sense is there um, that they had a number of early victories because they were able to uh, at least initially circumvent uh, some of the regulators, um, but. Uh, Uber and Lyft and the other very successful gig economy companies now are spending enormous amounts of money uh, defending uh, lawsuits primarily around the employee classification issue. Uh, <coughs> and um, they're operating um, in, um, been operating in California for a long time that has very employee favorable laws and they're, they're now a, a couple of unfavorable uh, cases. I think the final chapter uh, for them is yet to be written um, because uh, th th it's my understanding that the California Supreme Court is going to hear and make a decision of some sort on the employee classification issue, which will turn out to be very important, I think, in our country for those businesses. Yeah. Uh, a point I was trying to make earlier is that you should expect the life of blockchain or Bitcoin companies to follow the same path. So the um, uh, strategies that you talked about just now for Uber and Airbnb to disintermediate regulation is referred to in the literature as um, dis, uh, dis, what is it called? Entre regulatory entrepreneurship by Liz Pullman, right? And the idea is that you navigate very carefully the um, regulations to be outside the box so you don't have to comply. And when you can't, you consider doing it anyway, and then using what Abby Semler at Indiana talks about as platform advocacy. So they build this huge user base, and then they leverage them and send them, hey, this is happening in your city. If you want us to stick around, send an email or a letter to your county commissioner, right? And then the county commissioner gets like a million letters, and they're like, oh, never mind. We're not going to keep Uber out. Um, they've been able to use all that very successfully to continue what they're doing. I, you see that in certain very early stage Bitcoin companies like Coinbase. Um, Coinbase is a prime example of doing exactly what Uber did just in the Bitcoin space. Um, and now you might expect um, Bitcoin companies to have going forward the same kinds of problems, including the employment law problems as Uber. So Dash pays employees regularly and I think they're a partnership. Um, so the question is, are they gonna run into the same lawsuit type, like the exact same issues um, as the sharing economy as the whole thing unfolds? I think, I don't think they're very different at all. Um, so what is going to happen to Coinbase? So everybody, everybody knows what Coinbase is? Most people are nodding. Okay, so this is your entry, entry ticket if they take you, right? Uh, and they may not take you for, for a while. So what is going to happen to Coinbase? I mean, they have huge problems already. Uh, customer service, I think, well, I have strong opinions on their customer service. <laughs> but um, what is the SEC going to do with Coinbase and the exchanges? Um, <coughs> so my, my view, uh, and, and I won't make it Coinbase specific because there are a number of, uh, of businesses that utilize the term exchange and aren't, uh, don't have exchange licensure or uh, ATS licensure or DCM licensure in, in, the, in the US. So they don't have any claim uh, for a appropriate um, policing in um, uh, in the U.S. system. Um, so just to put a, a practice perspective on it, um, f for a, a while, uh, a lot of token issuers would do their uh, token issuance and then seek to enhance the liquidity of the token by uh, applying to individual exchanges to become listed on the exchange. Um, and uh, it thereby provide a means of liquidity for resale of their tokens. Um, at, at some point within the last year, one or more U.S. exchanges uh, decided that they had uh, some potential securities exposure and that they were going to deal with that by requiring that anybody that wanted to list their token uh, uh, receive either an opinion of counsel or a very lengthy and carefully worded memorandum uh, as to whether or not the token uh, that they s sought to list was a security. Um, 
<clears throat> and the idea being when the SEC comes, uh, ca comes knocking, they'd be able to say they operated in good faith because they had all these uh, opinions of, uh, of counsel. Um, I think as a practitioner, um, and not to get into what we did in the past, uh, the answer uh, that I give to people today is very simple. Uh, it, which is why would you want to pay a uh, hundred thousand dollars to get listed on a exchange uh, or, or I shouldn't call them an exchange a platform that's not likely to be in existence uh, in in the next year there's still law firms out there that are taking that money <laughs> today yeah uh, and, so. and, 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 and it's a it's a, it's a fair it's a fair business proposition and I could be wrong right this is a this is a prediction as to what's going to happen uh, in, in the marketplace, but I, I expect that every business that's operating as an exchange with U.S. customers is going to receive, um, if they haven't already, uh, some level of, uh, of they're going to engage in some manner of discourse with the SEC, and really the only choice is whether or not that's going to be voluntary or pursuant to subpoena at this point. And so that raises their cost structure. And the regulatory uncertainty that comes with that, what does that do in terms of regulatory competition for the US market for ICOs and crypto startups? Remember, again, 45% of all crypto startups are US based, yet we're dealing with this uncertainty increases in the, in the cost structure because of the uncertainty and having to deal with SEC type uh, regulatory approaches. What is happening to the crypto market in the, in the United States? So um, <clears throat> it would be a very rational uh, decision, uh, it seems to me, a as a U.S. business uh, to uh, contemplate a substantial amount of international organization, both uh, for formation of your issuing entity and selling uh, so that you could uh, engage in sales outside the United States in a tax-efficient basis that arguably is uh, um <coughs> choosing more favorable regulatory regimes uh, outside the U.S. and then uh, continue to appropriately and within the confines of the law um, limit your uh, token issuances uh, in the U.S. to uh, accredited investors. The, the rub, um, in, in my view, um, and this is not, this is a philosophical rub, uh, is uh, I if I'm really a, a issuer that has uh, a bona fide interest in interacting with consumers in the U.S., uh, the, the accredited investor only uh, model only takes me part of the way there. And that's why I think the questions that we got previously about Reg A plus and crowdfunding are, are really smart questions to be asking right now is how, if, if your business model is to interact <coughs> with, with U.S. consumers, can you really uh, take the position that you're only going to offer your tokens to consumers outside of the, outside of the U.S.? It, it's a hard question to answer. Is um, uh, more innovation from the issuers. So I think you'll see more zero X, right? You'll see more uh, completely autonomous, non-native, tokens running on top of Ethereum um, because it's harder to figure out who you go after if all you do is launch the thing and it people buy tokens from it and they can exchange tokens back to it. Um, I, then yes, it's still doing the same thing, which is money transmission and possibly even um, uh, other regulated activities, but who, who do you, as a regulator, go after to, to prosecute, et cetera? So I think you'll. I think the result is either pushing offshore, right, or, and or more innovation in the space to try and limit liability directly to within the blockchain system itself, which it goes back to the things you were talking about earlier. Uh, this, this is. I really appreciate this. So, basically, what if I understand you correctly, you're saying the answer to this is more decentralization. Yes. Does everybody understand? So. If the regulator doesn't give us a sandbox, the industry, the crypto industry, will naturally gravitate to more decentralized models that can be that are less likely to be, to be regulated. Let's take an example. So let's ex let's compare regulation, uh, the possibility of regulation, um, 
for a centralized crypto exchange such as Kraken versus a um, decentralized exchange, fully decentralized exchange, crypto exchange, uh, such as my Ether Delta or Ether Delta in this case. Yeah? One is a has a centralized money-making fee-paying um, aspect to it. I'm sorry if I'm doing this. Um, which is Kraken and the other ones, Poloniex is just bought by Goldman Sachs and so forth. They, are, they have revenue, ca revenue cash flow models that allow them to charge fees based on transactions. Yeah? So they're making money with, with char charging users of their exchanges fees. Yeah? They're, they're and they can control all of it. Yeah? They can control who gets on, when they get on, and so forth, versus Ether Delta, which is a fully decentralized exchange where nobody controls anything. The argument Carla brought forward, and I fully agree with that, is that if you want to minimize your regulatory exposure, you will go to the fully decentralized network business model because that is not going to be exposed. Or it's much, much less likely to be exposed ever to the regulatory scrutiny that we're otherwise facing in this country. So the regulatory regimes, I would say, may still apply, but it's harder to enforce, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Like harder to enforce against. Yeah. I think there's a... Check, check, check. So, hey, uh, David Duccini, Silicon Prairie Portal Exchange. We are actually a regulation crowdfunding portal operator. We do issuances on blockchains, tons of, sp uh, of, of experience in the space. I literally met with the OCC last week in Chicago to talk about the Special Purpose National Bank Charter. It is alive, uh, but it's tricky because of the, the state uh, bank uh, consortium. So uh, the short answer to your question is what, what are we going to see with Coinbase? I think we're going to see the same thing we saw with Polynex, where they become registered as a broker-dealer and then they get a waiver on all their past misdeeds, potentially. That's essentially what, what happened with the circle acquisition of Polino. So they're gonna, you know, they're gonna start down that path of broker-dealer because that's gonna be the easy entree. They're gonna start filing ATSs, right? The alternative trading. We actually just filed last week to get the get a stock transfer agency uh, spun up so we can start doing things like shareholder registries on blockchains. So we're actually taking the path of sort of I'm too old and too pretty to go to jail, so I'm going to work with the regulators. And the short, the short thing, the question back to the, the, the comment back of how do you en you engage with the regulators first? You send them paper, you ask for waivers, you document it, and then when you know you, you really want to engage them before they engage you, I guess is my is my short. You know, and then the final thought is with the Ubers and the Airbnbs, it wasn't the government that was going after them; it was the entrenched incumbents that are the haters on the models. Those are the ones, the f the frenemies. I call their frenemies. First, they hate you. And they revalue, and then eventually they take credit for your ideas. So I wanted to bring up um, something about, you know, if if I publish a book that contains code, this is on. If I publish a book that contains code that does something, and I give somebody in this room a book, and they take the book, and they enter it into their computer and release it onto an exchange you know, onto something that becomes a decentralized exchange or that does something that is, you know, regulatorily verboten. Um, at what point does does the fact that I wrote it down in a book, is that the part that is illegal or is it the part where somebody entered it into a computer or is it the part where somebody in the U.S. accesses that system? And then you're going to have a really interesting discussion about what's the difference between code and speech and money because in one sense bitcoin is in a way speech because it's it's a program with an algorithm and then where does any of this stuff you know the only thing about this the only reason i think this hasn't happened yet is because everyone's still looking at the idea of oh i can get a part of this ico and i, I haven't seen a whole lot of the, there there have been a few there have been a sort of socially motivated or issue or you know things where people aren't interested in the money they're interested in a cause or a political movement and and I think that's how does that change or how does that affect this regulatory environment hey, very complicated and I think thoughtful question um, so I'll take the coward's approach and just respond to the part that I want to talk about <laughs> <laughs> um, which is to to your last point um, about people's purpose uh, in utilizing blockchain. That's re very relevant to the fraud question, um, and I, I think you could 
argue pretty effectively um, that the SEC's uh, recent activity uh, is motivated by concerns about fraud. Uh, now, depending on how political you, can, you are, you could suggest that's because they were publicly expressed by members. Uh, but fundamentally, there still needs to be fraud there for the SEC to exercise uh, fraud jurisdiction. And at least to my way uh, of thinking, uh, there is now and always should be a role for regulators to play to, to police fraud. So uh, if you do have uh, uh, good intentions in your, your use uh, of the blockchain, um, uh, that suggests that the parade of horribles would stop somewhere uh, less uh, undesirable. Uh, than uh, it would for uh, real uh, bad actors. Uh, I'll, I'll also tell you that um, I did notice as a practitioner uh, the SEC's blockchain group uh, taking a different view with respect to activities that happened before they issued the Dow report uh, th than afterwards. So uh, at least at one point, well, one regulator was taking a nuanced view uh, that depended in part upon their belief as, uh, as to actors' education or uh, the knowledge that they should have with respect to, to applicable law. Uh, and that's, so that suggests to me, um, and this is an easy, easy thing to suggest as a lawyer, but that uh, action uh, informed uh, by an understanding of the law is going to be treated with uh, a greater respect than careless action that uh, is taken without regard to law. One last question before we break. So my name is Jill Saber. I'm an attorney, and this is all very fascinating to me because I don't actually practice in this area. Um, but my question kind of follows the last two comments. So. Um, when you're looking at fraud, is the fraud actually committed when the code is written, when it's actually put out there, or is it when commerce or the transaction is actually taking place? So when, like the SEC is looking at this, is it when a transaction has actually occurred, when the fraud has taken place? I don't really know the technical answer to this. It's a, it's a, it's a really good question. I, I will tell you that um, the staff, enforcement staff has taken a position for a long uh, time that they don't need to prove damages to bring in enforcement action. So the damages is a requirement of a private action versus uh, uh, a regulatory action. And so that suggests to me that um, uh, the fraud could attach early, earlier in the process than we, than we might uh, otherwise expect, but I, I don't know the technical answer to... Uh, well, you may not actually know who wrote the code, if unless they, they choose to take celebrity status for it. Yeah. Yeah, so if you do, though, there's no reason you couldn't go after it at each instance of the fraud, fraud, right? So um, this goes back to the, I'm thinking of the Dow example. So I, um, I'm not so sure how um, completely philanthropic the uh, writers of the code um, were intending to be, but um, we mooted the DAO uh, at Stetson, and after the and we had um, Florida judges sitting on the moot, and um, after they got past the, you gave your money to what, and how much money was it, and they stole like, and they could just keep stealing it over and over. We don't understand why you would do this in the first place. After they got past that, the the moot um, participants had um, brought forward as a breach of contract action, right, alleging that the DAO participants were partners in a partnership, and, and that the um, if the law was if the code was really law, that it was a, a partnership agreement that had been breached by the hacker, right, or the um, perhaps white knight hacker, however, which depending on which way you want to look at it. Um, the judge's response was, why did you bring a contract action? Why is this not simply a product liability um, claim? The code was designed to do something. It did not do that. It did something no one expected. This Just bring a product liability claim, and you know who wrote the code, go after them. So to the extent that you do know um, who wrote it, um, there's no reason why you couldn't look to them or try to look to them um, for some type of remedy, whether it's fraud or product liability or something else. Um, but the, the judges, the Florida judges, had no um, qualms whatsoever about suggesting that you bring Slockett in and, 
and hold them accountable from, for faulty code. Um, yeah. So um, we'll take a break now, and then um, the next speaker and lunch will be at 12.30. So you can head over there now. Uh, food should be served right across the sky in the atrium, and that's where the next speaker will be as well. And then we'll meet back here at about 1.20.